This actually ensemble started when you uh, put together an ensemble to, to celebrate uh, Linda Hoyle, the Fetch album, right? That's right. Yes. Um, in, in the process of recording that album, which was recorded both here and London, Ontario, it was a weird mixture. Um, I brought in my favorite players, to, the, the keyboard player, the drummer, all, the, all those kind of things, and some lovely faces turned up. And we were, it, we've got a, got a deal for it. It came out. Uh, we, we needed a launch gig. Uh, there's a little club in London, which I like, called the Pizza Jazz Club in Dean Street in Soho. Would you know that at all? Have you been there? I don't know that. Mark, have we ever been there? I don't know. Doesn't ring a bell, no. Man, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time so I just don't know it, man. We, we got to run That's a That's a great book you've got behind you, by the way. <laughs> oh, gee, what a coincidence. I was just the... I was going to ask you about that a little bit, too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's about above Getty Lee. <laughs> and it's above Getty Lee. What do you think of that? The, the pizza is, is about 200 yards from Ronnie's. It's the same area. And uh, I managed to get a slot there for a launch gig. Uh, it was hard to get because they booked months ahead. So we had this launch date in, I think it was February the 1st, five years ago. And I got as many of the players together as I could from, from the album. Uh, for this gig, wrote out the charts, and then two weeks before the uh, the show, I get this awful call from uh, Canada, from Linda, sounding terrible. She was so ill, she couldn't dare get on a plane. So I had the choice: of I could either cancel the gig, which I didn't want to do, or um, rethink it. So I rethought it, and added some of my favourite melodies. Completely, re it took two weeks to fr frantic writing and got a couple of extra guys in and by complete accident that was the start of the band it wasn't meant to be but uh, i thought at the end of the show i thought hey this is good i like this uh, yeah we'll start with the rhythm section like uh nick franz the drummer sure um nick i first encountered in a, he was in a band called loose tubes have you ever heard of that at all no um, Great name, I love that. Loose tubes. <laughs> Having had a few loose tubes in my life, in my life I could appreciate that. That's a really great name. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was an eccentric big band uh, about mm -hmm. twenty years ago. Uh, check them out; you'll find them. Okay. Um, but but they they were sort of conspiratorial. They, they were very silly, but great writers inside the band. And yeah. Nick was the drummer in this, and I loved his playing. It was just, it just, I, I can tell by watching a drummer if I can play with him or not. Uh, you just the, the way the flow of the, the, the limbs, it's great. And uh, he, he was just right. Strangely, I'd never worked with him before. So uh, we, we'd met a few times. But on this, this first date at the, at the pizza, it was the, the first downbeat was the first time I'd ever played with him. Wow. And it just, it was beautiful, it just worked. The guitar player. Ray is uh, probably my oldest friend. Uh, we met in 73 and he'd been, um, he was very much a jazzer, jazz player. He'd, he'd worked with John McLaughlin there and did oh. sessions together. In fact, he did a session with Jimmy Page and John McLaughlin, how about that? Wow, not too shabby. Um, <laughs> We kept in contact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone was busy that day. <laughs> yeah. Chris Bisco, um, again, we have a history, but it, it was a strange one. I was at university with him. I was doing physics, he was doing English. And we were aware of each other, but never actually played together. But again, I, I watched his progress, watched his career evolving. And uh, Linda knew him from Sussex days. Mm -hmm. So he, he seemed to be the, the perfect choice for soprano sax to play some lovely lyrical ideas on her album. And I thought, this is lovely. I love his playing. So he became part of the team. Karina, yes, um, a younger player. Um, she's 
very much. Do you know what the West End is in London? The West End Theatre. Yeah, sure, yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, she's top of that, really. She, she's principal percussion on many West End shows, and until the lockdown, she was doing the Tina Turner show. Wow. Um, so it's demanding stuff, and she also did the um, when there was that big event in Stratford uh, about seven or eight years ago. Um, <clears throat> can't remember what it's called now, but she was a drum captain. She led all lots of other drummers doing things, and uh, I recorded her on a couple of albums. And she's lovely, and she also looks better than everybody else, so she was a good choice. <laughs> Chris Hay, okay. um, I met him on a session many years ago, and he had that lyricism that certain fiddle players have, where he's not classical. He, he's, he can play ethnic stuff, Irish stuff, Jewish stuff, all kinds of uh, um, much more emotional playing, you know, no vibrato, very straight stuff. And uh, I thought one day I'll, I'll get him on something. And, I did. In fact, that was the start again. I brought him into Linda's album. He played on okay. three tracks of that. And I thought, hey, this is great. So I got him later to play. He's not on, uh, not in the band as such, but he played on a few tracks. Well, you know, Mo, you, this uh, album, it, it, these tracks have a personal connection to you. Uh, spanning your work with Gil Evans, Gary Burton. Um, what was your goal in reinterpreting these songs? Did you want to highlight, were you faithful to the originals? Was there any particular uh, uh, aspect of these songs that you wanted to highlight, the rhythm, the melody? No rule. Um, it's, they're songs that I've admired for a long time. Unless, for example, Django. Do you know Django, the John Lewis piece? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know that? Yeah, um, I first heard that when I was at university and some friends of mine in a jazz trio were playing it and it haunted me. It was a, a realization of a different kind of music. And years later, I did some research and found out that John Lewis, the composer, had been in, in uh, Paris during the war. He'd met Django and they became friends. And um, years later, they re-met in, in New York and hung out. And, watched each other play and then he died and John Lewis was very hurt by this and wrote this in memoriam piece mm -hmm. and that triggered a lovely idea for him. I love the idea of writing a piece of music for someone for a mate who's died and I wrote a piece called Jacko on one of my albums just after right. Jacko Pistorius had died. It's a lovely idea I think that. So that was that tune that's the uh, start of that one. Um, well, uh, Mark, um, I had asked about uh, some of the other tunes. Chickens, Steve Swallow's Chickens, which uh, yeah. he approved of. Yeah, Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, the fiddle connections again. Um, yes. It, um, we, we'd been hanging out with Gary Burton's quartet at Ronnie Scott's, mm -hmm. and he did this tune that Steve Swallow played, a double bass player played Chickens, which right. I loved. Then I heard the record, they brought a record out, and it had this guy called Richard Green playing fiddle on it. And oh, that's a lovely idea. Look, I'd never heard that sound before. Wow. So it took, it took 50 years to be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but the timing and to get the guys and everything. And that's why that track has, has fiddle on it. Wow. How about uh, Hendrix's Little Wing? Yeah, you did Little Wing, great track. <laughs> What more can you say? Um, we love Hendrix. Uh, Ray, Ray Russell told me a lovely story. He, do you remember Cat Stevens? Of course, yeah. Of course, yes. But around about 1967, Ray was in his band. Um, they were touring Scandinavia. And their support act was the Jimi Hendrix Experience. It gives you an idea. Yeah, Is this when Cat was still doing his, like, his British pop thing when he was clean shaving, wearing... You know, like wearing a turtleneck and suit, suit and tie before he grew the beard. Sort of, yes, his yeah. big, hit, his big hit was "I Love My Dog." <laughs> that uh, says it all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ray's touring with them, and Hendrix's support. One night, 
uh, Ray goes to bed in his hotel, which happens to be on the ground floor. And he hears a tap on the window, opens the curtains. There's Jimi Hendrix standing there in his full stage outfit, mm -hmm. um, saying, hey man, I got locked out of the hotel. Can you let me in? So Jimi Hendrix climbs through Ray's bedroom window and they sit on the bed for a bit and talk about Stratocasters. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, Ray's in his pajamas and Ray <laughs> said, I said, do you fancy a cup of tea? And he did. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, Gil Evans, uh, The Pan Piper and Gone, and a couple of your own compositions. Why were these compositions so important to you? Do you, do you know the, the trilogy of albums that Gil Evans did with Miles Davis? Yes, of course. Sketches of Spain. Right. Paul sure. yeah. Well, yeah. one of the albums, Porgy and Bess, mm -hmm. uh, it had a track on it called Gone. Uh, can I give you a little bit of history about Gershwin? Okay. Um, this I found, I found fascinating. He, as you probably know, he worked on lots of musicals and it, yes. it was always hard. One night he's lying in bed in this hotel and, and uh, he can't sleep. He's worrying too much. And there's a bed by the side, a, a book by the side of the bed. And he thinks, if, well, if I, I'll, I'll read this, that'll put me to sleep. Starts reading and he can't stop reading. It's fascinating. And the book was called Porgy. Mm -hmm. And it was written by, oh God, I've forgotten his name now. The, the guy who wrote the, the, all the lyrics. And he wrote to this guy in the morning, said, can I, can I make this into an opera? And uh, they met and finally, and characters were added, it became Porgy and this. Dubois Hayward was the author. Yes, that's the man, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the, the birth of that. And then I heard the, the Gil Evans version, which stunned me. And I, um, there's the, 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 it's the lament again, that they're called Gone, 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 which he wrote. Mm -hmm. And Miles Davis plays it beautifully. And there's a section at the end lasts about, I don't know, 15 seconds of descending harmony. That I, when I was at college, I, I didn't understand anything about harmony, but I just loved it. Yeah. And I made a tape loop uh, running at seven and a half inches per second. And this loop went all around my bedroom, around packets of biscuits and cups and everything. So I could hear these harmonies over and over again. It was great. Um, again, 50 years had to go by. Mm -hmm. And I had to get lots of help uh, to, to transcribe the parts. And I got in contact with Miles Evans, who's Gil's son, who I'd met in the orchestra, who lived in San Diego. And he managed to find Gill's charts, the actual chart. Wow. So I was able to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, a nightmare because it was just a you know rows of instruments, full full sure. orchestral chart, no chords, no chords, no piano. So we had to work out who played what. It took a long time. Mm -hmm. And that was the original lament. Then Gil Evans himself had done a speeded up version called Gone, with lots of drum breaks. And mm -hmm. that again fascinated me. So I spent a long time trying to figure out how to do that, how to reduce a full jazz orchestra down to six people. You know, uh, whenever Mark and I are in London, we have to go by Ronnie Scott's. We have to go there. Uh, sure. you, you know, you 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 know, you have great stories. You told us about Miles Davis coming to see Affinity there. Uh, what is what are your emotions when you go to Ronnie Scott's and you're standing on that stage fifty years later? It was a, a great learning experience. It's like a university because of meeting yeah. these, or not meeting necessarily, but watching the great, the jazz greats. Yeah. And standing at the back and seeing it for, for free. Can I tell you one of his stories? Tell me. <laughs> He's just standing, this is him doing his nightclub act in between playing beautifully. He was talking about after the. Uh, after the war here, it was a period of great austerity, uh, very hard to get things. And his mum used to buy his, his school clothes at a, at a place called the Army and Navy store, which is right. all surplus stuff. And he said, but let me tell you, it wasn't easy for a 10 year old Jewish kid from the East End having to go to school dressed as a Japanese admiral. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, jazz started out as, as live anyway, didn't it? The recording bit came later. Um, it's, it's a live medium. It's, it, it has to be played live. I don't know how you, when, when you're playing it in the studio, I don't, don't really know how you do it because there's no feedback. There's no um, response from this room. The room is very much part of the performance. <laughs> 